Tina Nixon yesterday talking about trying to get her son. He's a helicopter pilot and flies in various and does a dangerous job in various parts, far flung parts of the world. Um, and Tina's a mate of mine, like, can attest to how difficult she found uh, that time. Problem was, it didn't really have to happen. All through the pandemic, there was at least one guy, and we're going to talk to him now, who had all sorts of really bright and clever ideas how we could use technology and computers and a system. Um, to avoid the inhumanity that Tina talked about. His name is uh, Sir Ian Taylor. You'll know him. And he joins us uh, on the line now. Uh, Ian, nice to chat to you again, mate. How are you? I'm good, thanks. That was really moving, wasn't it? Yeah. And it didn't have to be, did it? No. No, it didn't. Um, And, and, you know, it, it was interesting that um, even as you know, a group of us put forward cases to we you know we called it bring the Kiwis home, um, bring our Kiwis home. Even as we put that, there was a whole kind of thrust, and I can only imagine it was being driven from out of you know government or wherever that just placed this question over you know put put us in this this basket that what we were trying to do was throw the board, borders open and endanger everyone. It was quite the opposite. You know, we, we had been proposing ways of, first of all, building a priority. I remember, I remember questioning why there wasn't a priority system in the bookings. And Chris Hipkins actually said that um, I didn't, you know, people asking for this had no idea how difficult it was to do. And I remember my response to that was, Putting a rocket out of Mahia around the moon, that's difficult. <laughs> Building one of these systems is a piece of cake. And the, I, I saw versions of how we could do it. And it was really, really simple. But the other thing was that there was a way of bringing people home in that really severe time where you made sure no one got on the plane with COVID. The whole thing was around efficient testing before people got on the planes and as soon as they got off. You know, yeah. the reason for MIQ was they had a shambolic testing system which required at least two weeks to get a result and no one knew who had COVID getting on the planes. Well, Ian, y- your pleas and those of others feel like, fell on absolutely deaf ears. And I guess I was playing devil advocate. The government can argue it was very busy. It was in crisis. Why should some rich guy jump the queue in terms of telling the government what to do? So, I mean, I like the bit about rich, you know. I mean, you know, there was that whole that whole thrust. The, the people that I was working with came from the full cross-section to, you know, a really amazing technology company owned by a Samoan working in Manukau. You know, this wasn't about whether you were rich, whether you were business. It was. We looked and you knew the government was under pressure. And, you know, that's understandable. Everybody was under pressure. Um, you know, people had said that I was critical of the government. If, if anyone goes back to the first half dozen um, articles that I wrote, they weren't critical. They were, you did a great job, now let us help you. You know, mm. you, the, the big question that I have for the commission, which I mentioned in that article, was there was almost a year and a half went by between the first lockdown and the second lockdown that, you know, closed Auckland for weeks and weeks and weeks, cost billions of dollars. And the second lockdown was absolutely identical to the first one. No one did anything about that in a one in 16 month gap where there's the time they could have talked to us. Mm. And, you know, it wasn't me. I was, I was kind of, I always keep thinking I was just a singer in a band, you know. I was the person who (laughs) actually was able to get my voice out there Yep. But the voice was for all of the other people who'd been ignored who were trying to give advice. And they weren't rich people. They were Kiwis who really cared about the ki- Kiwis who were caught overseas. Do you think those people, you yourself and the people who suffered through this, and there was doubtless suffering, and Tina's just one example of it, do you think they are owed an apology from this government, which seems happy to apologise for all sorts of historic injustices and imagined slights at the drop of a hat on other matters? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it was it was a basic human right for Kiwis to come home. We we actually had the easiest borders in the world to protect. We're a little island tucked away down 
down the bottom of the world. You know, and for me, the biggest um, biggest mistake the government, well, I don't know whether it was a mistake, but their whole idea that they were going to be focused solely on saving lives, w- which is easy when you've got a locked off border, like all, all you had to do was lock the place up and not let anyone in, yeah. including your own citizens. The challenge that, you know, we should have placed the Kiwis, and that's all Kiwis, the technology, everybody, should, let's figure out how we save lives and livelihoods. Those two things are intertwined, and if we don't put them together, we will be suffering from this way after the COVID um, pandemic is over. Mm. Lives and livelihoods. And there was a way to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. And um, Morris Williamson, you know, everybody gives, every, you know, sort of often people give Morris a, a hard time, but Mar- Morris was a really skilled programmer. Um, yeah. And Morris, Morris actually called up Chris Hipkins and said, I've written the algorithms that you could prioritize for that dumb MIQ system that, um, you know, was being yeah. talked about before. There's a way to prioritize people and get the most needy home, and it's easy. And he was just dismissed. Yeah. Yep, so many people, I, I think, in so many fields during the COVID, if you were not, you mean, if you were not me, one I, of I, the favoured, one of the chosen ones, you, nothing you said was going to be uh, paid any attention. You know, it, it, it's so often it's, you know, people will sort of say, oh, it's easy to criticise. I mean, people like Morris, they weren't just criticising, they were offering solutions. And just very quickly, to put this in context, as you think about what the ombudsman said, so the MIQ system... It was necessary. We had to have some sort of um, controls. But Morris's thing was you just had an algorithm that, first of all, put people, it just knew when you logged on so that you didn't have to go back every time to end up at the bottom of the queue again. Queue again so yeah. there was a priority. And then then you got bonus points if you, you got some bonus points in the priority system if you were overseas when COVID hit. So that distinguishes people from people who went yeah. overseas knowing it was going to be hard to get back yeah. to those who were caught. Yeah, and but then, look, I, I'm next, going to put, yep, put a yep, counterfactual here. Sorry. The government yeah. gave everyone two weeks to get home when COVID first hit. It was well, very clear. Well, and Winston, uh, was it, was it, yeah, Winston Peters said it. Get home now. Yeah, and people, and people did. But what about the people who couldn't get home? I mean, that's two weeks. You know, you've got jobs, you've got, um, you know, a lot of, if you were on holiday, maybe you could break your holiday short. But if you were working overseas, which is what happened to so many Kiwis, and then we got that really arrogant, we're at home, ah, you you chose to leave, you're not coming home, they're Kiwis. You know, yeah. that's it. And and after that two weeks, you know, I, I, saw, I was sent th- hundreds of emails of people who didn't make it home for really legitimate reasons, yeah. but also expected that, right, we won't race home this two weeks, but we're not going to be locked out of our country. And we will be, be able to get an MIQ and it'll be a pain doing the quarantine, yeah. but, yeah. oh, but at least yeah. I'll get on. But I'll be able to get home. Yeah, and instead yeah. they find the Wiggles, the Hollywood movie makers and their nannies, um, MP Ricardo Mendenez March and his boyfriend able to come and go. And if you're a DJ who knew the Prime Minister or Clark Gayford, it seemed, and you were arty farty enough or doing some party, you were going to get in. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, you know, you know that, yeah, that would sort of piss people off. But I think it's, it's a bigger question than that. That, that, that was. Um, manipulation of the system that was in place. What we should be questioning is the system that was in place. Mm. It was, uh, well, it was just unfit for purpose. Mm. See, and you haven't changed your tune on this, um, but I guess in some ways in an article you published in the Herald yesterday, it would appear that on a deep and fundamental level you have changed your political tune and that you no longer trust or recognise um the Labour Party as it is today, just how much of a, you know, woke lefty were you, Ian, um, uh, before all this? Well, you and I you and I could talk for hours about the term woke, you know, I just think it's a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a, you know, every time I see it... I oh, I love it, it gets you going. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't, it actually doesn't get me going, you know, sort of like, oh, well, you yeah. know, be that as it may. But, you know, I, I, you know, I, the, 
Yes, I have. It, it, my, I've lost, well, actually, did I lose faith in politicians? Actually, it's politicians right across the board. When you look at politicians and even now, the point scoring that happens when, as a country, we have some enormous challenges facing us. And we, we and, and the people running those across all parties spend all of their time point scoring in that childish chamber called Parliament. You know, it's some, some of the discussion and debate that goes on there is just point scoring nonsense. It would never happen. I mean, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, sitting in, a, in our boardroom discussing where we go during COVID, there was none of that stupid stuff that happens, that happens every day. So, you know, it's, it's one of the things that COVID, COVID taught us is that Mother Nature moves really, really fast. And politicians aren't equipped to move at that speed, and quite understandably. But what happened with this government, and who knows what would have happened with others, I don't know, but was they actually thought that they were the only ones who could fix it, and they're not equipped to do it. They're not equipped to move at the speed you need to speed at as Mother Nature changes the rules every second day. Well, Ian, the problem is for the moment, democracy or Westminster constitutional democracy, parliamentary democracy, sorry, is what we've got. And of all the bad systems of government, it, as Winston Churchill said, it's the least worst uh, of the lot. Are you suggesting that people shouldn't simply opt out of politics? Or is no, it a case I, of I, making no, a bad choice, you know, picking the best of a bad bunch? No, you know... I mean, I, there is another thing. I've, I've worked with politicians across all realms. And, you know, at the core, most of them are there for the right intentions. But once they get inside that kind of um, thing, it sort of, it, it becomes them and us. That's a fight. I mean, it is sort of naive of me, probably. It, the, I think the system is a good one. What we need is the people inside it to start thinking a little more collaboratively about the good of everyone, of, you know, and it's... Uh, just, I'll just give you a little example. So I'm working with a whole lot of scientists and things around how we handle climate change. And, you know, one of the things is we've got, you know, one, part, one lot on one side saying, get rid of all the cows, you know. And we know that if you, we get rid of the cows, someone else will need to put them on. So yeah, yeah. as you look at the whole planet, it gets worse. So that's kind of a simple argument. But on the other side... There are scientists working quietly away that have a way that says, actually, instead of getting rid of the cows, why don't we deal to the problem of cows? And there's some amazing science in New Zealand. In fact, we are doing developed. an interview with a guy, uh, the founder of an outfit called Methane Mitigation, uh, in the next half oh, hour of the isn't break. That, isn't that wonderful? I saw, his, I saw his ad in the paper yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, it, I've got to catch up with him because... We're working on a, on, on a big group that's working with all the research places. That's called the Product Accelerator. And its focus is how do we bring these two conflicting sides together and say there is a solution and it's for the betterment of the whole planet. And more importantly, it's a multi-billion dollar opportunity for New Zealand to create IP that changes the world, mm. not shifts the problem from us to someone else. Meantime, what does Ian Taylor do when he walks into the polling booth next year? I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've, uh, you know, I, whilst I've supported Labour all my life, I did, I have voted national twice. I voted for John Key when he indicated that Peter Sharples would be important and the Māori Party would be important in this thing. And yeah. I worked with Peter in that. And, you know, the, the work Peter did during those days has been unheralded. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. And then the other time was, um, was the, um, the uh, oh God, Bill, Bill's um, thing that all investment had to show a social return. And mm. I thought, that makes sense as well. Mm. So I'm, you know, I'm now looking for someone who has answers, not complaints. All right. Look, one final thing before we go, because I've got time, and I know I'll probably regret this. Uh, Ian, I think this is the third conversation we've had on the platform. We've known each other uh, for a while. Something else has arisen during COVID and in response, I guess, to the inhumane or illogical decisions made in some areas. And that is a movement that I've now renamed the anti-faxers, not the anti-vaxxers. 
people who are convinced that the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine as it was in New Zealand um, was dangerous to people, that tens or hundreds of thousands of people are dying from vaccine side effects and there are, you know, documentaries and support groups and everything else. Have you bought into that? Because you're highly critical of the government, but it seems to me you have resisted the urge to go for long conspiracy theory nutter. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> well, the question is, do you buy into uh, the ever-increasingly extreme and shrill rhetoric of those who say the other great problem was the vaccine? Um, so, no, I, no, I don't. Um, but, but I would put this in context. I put it in context mm. that um, I think that the reason we now have this huge divide is that we very quickly moved to a stage where, where if you didn't do the vaccine, you were somehow on the out, on the other side. You, you know, and I, I, I had legit, I have legitimate questions. I, you know, our whole company was vaccinated very fast, but it was all optional. And no one was placed under threat. Okay, so did anyone have an adverse reaction or lose their sight or die as a result no. of that? No. no. Yeah. No. No. So I'm. But but where I where I do stand was that you know everybody we should have that, that thing happened really fast. I mean we're talking about Pfizer. You know if if Pfizer if Pfizer made the biggest money ever out of those. If we were looking at the good of the planet, you would have thought that actually these vaccines will not be used to make in gigantic profits. That's the first thing. But where I sort of drew my line was, I would be re I'm really concerned that we, I still, I personally, still don't know enough about giving it to my grandchildren. You know, if, right. my, if my children want to do what that. What about the but blood I, issue I with baby W? Enough. Where did you stand on that? That was, you know, that was a, that was an interesting one. So you went backwards and forwards as the facts came out. But you know, my my initial reaction was, and again, you know, I'm fully supportive. I, you know, as I said, my whole family's vaccinated. I think there were steps we had to take. But my initial reaction, again, as I looked at it, was, if there is a solution where they could have another sort of blood, why aren't we talking about it at least? Okay. But as it as it as it progressed, you went, oh, that's why, that's why, yeah. that's why. No, actually, he's three months old. Get him in there, fix him. Yeah. But but again, you know, I think that's the problem. Is that you know, if I if if you're a vaxxer or an anti vaxxer and you go on Google and you search things, all you get is the side of the story that you're on. And yeah. what I try to do is listen. You know, there's a yeah. a, a Pacifica thing called Tullandar. Yep. Yep. You always talk and listen with respect. Yeah, you don't have to I, I got to say, I've fallen off that bike, and I did yesterday with a guy because I'm just slightly frustrated with the craziness of it all. Ian, can yeah. I ask you? You've written this piece it, in the it Herald. It is crazy. Some, I, I agree with you. You know, some of these things are now so extreme; it's it's almost criminal. Yeah, um, and so you've written this piece in the Herald. It's you're trending on Twitter. Um, do you get involved in politics next year? No, no. Um, you know, I I won't bore you with it now. But I have, we have, we've gone down a different path. Um, I've given up talking to old people. I say we've developed a platform. We've spent a million dollars on it, funded by a really generous Parkia guy, where we've put a platform into schools called Mato Dunga. Oh, Prime that's yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about. Uh, and yeah. honestly, yeah. And honestly, I look at what I went to a school the other day, and I just looked at this and I thought. Our future is in great hands. These kids will come out and they will be much better informed. We just have to keep things in place till they get out. <laughs> all right, Ian. Hey, as always, mate, just be. lovely talking to you. I wish you all the well, uh, best for the festive season and I hope to talk to you again next year. You too. Cheers. Thanks, Jim. Cheers. On. See ya. That is Sir Ian Taylor. Uh, interesting take. So there was a solution to MIQ that would have been more humane, more understanding, would have had less DJs and wiggles and would have prioritised people and not created the horrible thing where people waited for hours on end and then the queue closed. Um, just sorry, it's just a little word.
Prime Minister. It's just a little word and it can mean mean so much.